Because <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure this is going to work, but we're going to try it <laughs> to make sure. Um, if you will, in your Bibles, if you have your Bibles with you, turn to Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5. And we're going to look at some verses throughout the whole book of Proverbs. Um, let me tell you a little story about how I got through college. Uh, I was, I went to UNC Charlotte, and I drove up Highway 29 from Charlotte, uh, UNC Charlotte, to downtown. I worked at the uh, Baptist bookstore on 7th Street, and every day I would go from class, I'd leave class immediately after class, I'd go to work, work till 5, 6, or 7, then go home and do my homework. So um, that was, uh, there was a lot going on in college. I didn't feel like I was the smartest guy in the world. I had to keep up with that. And then my own personal life. Some of you know my family history. My mom was going through some difficult things. I was going through some difficult things. Dad was too. It was not a safe place for me, except on the radio between the time that I left UNC and that I got to work the few times in my life that I turned to a gospel music station and heard what I call now a radio preacher. Now, I have a love-hate relationship with radio preachers, but I got to admit, this guy got me through a lot of tough times. He was one of those guys, like a present pastor, who could sing as well as preach. In fact, and I, I, you'll know who I'm talking about when I say this, he could play piano like his cousins. I don't know if you know who his cousins might be. Why are you? Uh, laying there from Texas. A lot of them. One of them's name is Mickey, and one of them's name is Jerry Lee. So if you know who his cousin is, you know the preacher I'm talking about. Well, the preacher got me through some tough times. I can hear him now as he sat down at his piano and started playing the same theme songs he played every week. Man, I live for those songs. I just, he got me through some tough times. And then one day I heard that uh, he had had a fall from grace. He had a lovely wife that was on TV with him all the time. And part of his ministry, an important part of his ministry, he preached to thousands, millions of people in, in person and on the radio. But he had gotten caught with a woman that... Uh, even to my little 19-year-old uh, self, didn't have a whole lot to offer. Wasn't as pretty as his wife. Um, it was just, uh, I don't know what it was, but I do know that he lost his family in, in a certain way. His, his wife stayed with him. He lost his ministry. He lost a lot of people following him. He's not just a shell of the person that he once was. And I thought, what in the world possessed him to be able to, to make a decision? And it had to be a decision. You just don't fall into this. But sometimes you have to decide, I'm just going to give up everything that I've ever known, everything I've ever loved for this person over here and this relationship over here. Uh, that, have you ever had anything like that happen in your life? Or you might know who I'm talking about. It could be any of the ministers that we've seen fall from grace. And uh, most of the time, if I told you a minister fell from grace, what sort of sin do you think he did? <laughs> I hear you laughing, Craig. <laughs> sexual sin. Yeah. Most of the time, you would think it would be sexual sin. Yeah. Now, know that there are all, a lot of other sins. Uh, sometimes there is, uh, in fact, I was at a county when I was uh, in my other job as a counselor for the Baptist hospitals, to the county, and they got rid of nine pastors in one night. About half of them needed to go, but the other half, I don't know where God was, but he wasn't in that assembly that night because those preachers had a tough time. Uh, but I made the decision. Uh, Sometimes it's just there is a personality problem between the pastor and the church. Sometimes it's a money problem. But more times than not, it's a sexual sin. 
does the Bible say anything about sex? <laughs> well, and of all times for us to be talking about this, it's the first recorded session. I never talk about this, by the way. Uh, now, <laughs> my history is is such that uh, it's very it's a very comfortable task. What I used to do is I used to be a sex therapist, and I got more comfortable not from being a therapist but from my mom. Uh, mom was a public health nurse. And you remember those movies that most of us saw in the fifth grade? Uh, the little egg in the comes up with a little uh, uh, luggage and they all travel back together and they go into a house and the baby comes up. Uh, she made me watch those movies with her. And there's nothing that will open you up to just about any conversation. There's no embarrassment I have at all talking about the subject. <laughs> but, because um, that was my upbringing. But, it's interesting that chapter five of Proverbs, and it's been talking about all sorts of things, but then uh, Proverbs chapter five, verses one and two, and I'm going to read those out. The rest of you can turn to them if you don't mind. Um, Proverbs five to, uh, chapter five, I'm going to read verse one and two, and I'm going to let you all just read. And, and we've gotten used to that phrase. He's talking to his son, talking to now remember, by the way, this is Solomon talking to his son. Does anybody know any more about adultery than Solomon? <laughs> That's one of the ironies of the Bible, is of all people to be talking to his son about his son. Pay attention to my wisdom and turn your ear to my words of insight. Now notice what he says here. He's gone from my teaching and my instruction. He says, listen, bud, this is wisdom. And I guess you, he got this wisdom because he lived through the effect <laughs> of adultery. This is my wisdom. Now, you pay attention, my son, and you don't let your ears waver from these words of insight that you may maintain, and he lists a word there that we haven't heard before, that you may ma maintain discretion and your lips may per, per, uh, persevere. Now notice how many words he put in those two verses that have something to do with instruction, knowledge, or wisdom. Wisdom, how many do you count in your translation? Did he go back to his, a, a word that means teaching or knowledge or insight or something like that? Four. In, four, in two short verses, he mentions something about a wisdom or a teaching or a knowledge, and then he throws in this words discretion. Have you heard that word before? What does discretion mean to you? Making a choice. All right, it involves making a choice. Uh, nobody's going to drag him into this. It means making a choice. What else does it mean? Discernment. Right, discernment. It, yeah, it's, it looks like that. Discernment. Now, tell me, you're not going to get away with that, John. Tell me a little bit about what discernment means. Well, I just said that because my translation says that instead of uh, discretion. Okay, <laughs> discernment and discretion may be similar. That's what that Bible means, by the way. <laughs> so, discretion and discernment mean the same kind of thing. That means it seems like there's a, a <clears throat> sometimes the choice is not very clear. It's not between good and bad. We're good. At, we can do that, right? We can make a choice between good and bad. But discernment is a choice between good and best. Being a Christian doesn't so much mean a, uh, a choice between being good or bad. We've got that down pat. But sometimes it looks like it means a choice between being good and the best that we can be. I don't know. What when I saw discernment, there also seems to imply maybe some experience in that too. That I've gone through this and I know what I'm talking about. Uh, anybody else? The, the word discretion? <clears throat> My translation says good sense. Good sense. <laughs> <laughs> now, why does this group laugh when we mention good sense? Because <laughs> there's not much out there. All right, it's more precious than gold, isn't it? <laughs> 
common sense or good sense. Uh, we certainly are lacking in a lot of that, but it says, listen, um, so that your lips may preserve in, uh, that you maintain in your mind discretion and your lips may preserve knowledge. That means not only do you know what's right or wrong, but you teach what's right or wrong. Because we're going to hear a lot about lips later on in Proverbs. And then in the New Testament, you hear a lot about loose lips. And we all know what <laughs> loose lips do, right? Think ships. Think ships. Yes. <laughs> all right. So that's the first two verses. Apparently, what I'm going to say next is something we need to pay attention to because this is wisdom, it's insight, it's discretion, and it's knowledge. I'm expecting something really big. Uh, in this chapter to follow. So let's, uh, if somebody who has their Bibles, read verses three through six. I'll read it. Thank you. Um, For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, <clears throat> sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell, lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life. Her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. And in my King James book, it gives a footnote that it says for verses one through six, the son must incorporate the values of the father into his life before the temptation described actually occurs. Moral stability prior to the temptation is the prerequisite <clears throat> for successful resistance. All right. I'm glad that you mentioned what translations that you were reading because some of us have different words. Now, in the first verse, we're going to come back to what you just said because it's really important. In verse number three, lips of the, you mentioned strange woman. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> You remember what I just said about uh, about good sense and stuff like that? <laughs> yeah, you got that joke, didn't you? <laughs> um, we are surrounded by a lot of strange women. But now, how many have a different translation other than strange women? Uh, Immoral. What, what, John? Immoral. Immoral woman. Anybody got anything in? Another man's wife. Say that again? Another man's wife. Oh, another. What translation have you got? <laughs> <laughs> the English Standard Version. Okay. Right. I've got adulterous woman. Adulterous woman is what I got too, D. Um, which one of those things is true, by the way? Which one of those translations is true? I love them. I love them. Well, yeah, that's exactly what strange means. It means a person that's not your wife, a person that you're not related to. Um, uh, an adulterous woman uh, uh, is another translation of that. Um, now, he, he gave a great setup in verses one and two, and suddenly he's talking about an adulterous woman or a strange woman here. Um, I hope he gets to something spiritual pretty soon here because he's, uh, well, just by the words that you read, this is too much like a TV show or, or like um, Congress or, or like the people down the street or some of our lives. This is way too practical to be spiritual, I think. Um, for the lips of the adulteress or the strange woman drips honey. Honey, anybody? Uh, that's how they used to sweeten things. Remember they called the uh, promised land the land of milk and honey. So you got to know that honey was a particular good thing right here. There's a reason why, by the way, they picked honey because it takes a little bit longer for honey to come to a hive. You've got to wait for a long time, maybe as much as a year. Anybody raise bees? I know my brother is a master beekeeper and he says something about it takes at least a couple of years to make a good hive. Honey never spoils. Uh, they never, honey never spoils, does it? It always is the same. I've got some that are that's three years old, all I have to do is heat it up and it tastes just as good. What is honey used for, by the way, sweetener? Yep. Uh, anything that's else? Nothing. Medicinal. Yeah. It's medicinal, yeah. Uh, 
So we read where this adulterous woman, this person comes on and it's in the guise of, well, it's not an adulterer, it's an angel, it looks like to me. If she, she's coming and it sounds like honey, isn't that something we want? <laughs> we want a sweeter life? This is going to be, there's something to this verse. And her speech is smoother than, you said, oh, all right? Yes. Anybody got 10W30 uh, in your Bible? <laughs> <clears throat> you got to know this is olive oil, right? <laughs> this is olive oil. Very slick. And olive oil, by the way, is used a lot. And, and again, it's, it's necessity. It's something that people need and want. So here we have a woman who is not the for man, but he's coming across, but she's coming across like she's going to save his life with all this sickness, all this oil. But the end is bitter as gall. You know what gall is? Another translation in verse four. Bring you some Worm, wormwood. Wormwood, yeah. Wormwood is the old version of that. Uh, if you've ever tasted wormwood, it is very, very bitter. Uh, gall, by the way, you'll hear about that in the New Testament. Remember when? Isn't that given to Jesus on the yes. cross? Uh huh. It's it's a very bitter kind of thing, uh, and it doesn't have the results that uh, honey does. And sharper than a double-edged sword. Now, why do you think of all metaphors? They mention that this woman, uh, it looks like she's bringing life to this man, but it actually brings death, a double-edged sword. Why do you think a double-edged sword? Now, I believe that the Bible is inspired word of God. So when, when I pick these words apart, I hope you know that it's because that I think there's something to each metaphor that's used. Double-edged sword, what is that? Well, it says in this transition that she leaves nothing but bitterness and pain. So maybe that's one side of the sword and the other side of the sword. Bitterness on one side and pain on the other side. Exactly. Um, it cuts both ways. It cuts both ways. That's what yeah. I was thinking too. What else? Uh, a lot of times you'll see a blade with just one side of it. And so you got to figure out which side is the dull side if you're going to use it for wicked purposes. A two-edged sword, uh, sword, it's only one purpose for that, by the way. It's, it's to fight, it's to, kill. to kill somebody. Yeah. So here we have, is it a stretch to say, here we have a, a, a strange, an evil woman that's dressed up like an angel. And later on, in the books of the New Testament, you'll hear that phrase that it's not so much that this person comes across as evil right off. At first, this looks like this person is going to save your life, going to make your life much better and sweeter. And then later on, you're going to find out what's really going on with this. Um, in the New Testament, it talks about somebody coming in like an angel and then uh, you're finding out it's a wolf in sheep's clothing, almost. You'll hear that phrase several times in the Bible. Now, somebody read verses 7 through 11. Anybody else want to um, talk about the way of life, uh, a path? And then it says, by the way, in verse 6, her paths wander aimlessly, but she doesn't even know it. Mm -hmm. It's not so much that you're a fool, but she is too. She's just kind of running in circles. Here we have somebody saying, follow my wisdom and don't follow this person because they're going to wander aimlessly. Uh, there's an aimlessness to, not, uh, to life. There is a uselessness to life. Uh, now somebody, uh, 7 through 11, who's got the Bible? I'll read. Okay, thank you. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Do not turn aside from what I say. Keep to a path far from her. Do not go near the door of her house, lest you lose your honor to others and your dignity to one who is cruel. Lest strangers feast on your wealth and your toil enrich the house of another. At the end of your life, you will groan when you, your flesh and body are spent. Oh gosh, tell me what uh, he 
hear and what you see in that passage? Trouble. Yes, there's a lot of trouble here. Uh, in fact, it says, by the way, when you look back on your life, this is verse 11, when you look back on your life, if you follow this path, you will grow uh, when your flesh and body are spent. Well, that's sad. Um, some of you may be aware of um, there is a stages of life that you go through. Uh, the search for identity is important in the teenage years. The search for autonomy is, is, um, is what two-year-olds go through. That's why they say no all the time. They try to uh, put their uh, autonomy on you. The last of life is a stage we call generativity. Is my life worth it? Have I contributed what I want to? Am I going to die with half my life still left in me? Here it says, you're going to look back at your life, and you are not going to be pleased. That's what the last verse says. Something in the verse 7, in the first verse that Robin read. What did you pick out in verse 7? Anything? Anything different in verse 7 that you hadn't seen before? Children instead of son. Yeah. All right. Now, it's interesting. Uh King James over here says children. Mm -hmm. How many of your Bibles say sons? Plural. Mm -hmm. Now, isn't that interesting? Up until then, <coughs> my son, my son, my son. And now he's saying, let me tell you all something. You all is a nice Southern word. Let me tell y'all something. Uh, my sons, who are the sons he's talking about here? Anything you guess is better as good as mine because there's no note on the bottom of my page there. Well, actually, it applies to all of us now. It's going to apply to all of us. Now, we're talking about a strange woman. Uh, could, it be to, could we be talking about a strange man to you women? Yes. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So there are strange men and strange women. There are people not our spouses. Uh, it may even grow deeper because it's talking about, listen, be faithful, my sons. Now, again, this is the king. So you got two choices who he's talking about. You remember how many wives Solomon had? A lot. A bunch. He had a bunch. <laughs> and how many porcupines did he have? <laughs> I don't know about porcupines. <laughs> he had a lot of porcupines. <laughs> So, the one commentary I read said he got all his children together. And he said, this is so important that you all need to know this. Uh, some people say that he actually was talking to the royal court uh, as if a father talked to a son. A king, it's not a king talking to his subjects. It's a father talking to a son, a bunch of sons right here. And then he talks about this dismal thing. Uh, don't turn aside from what I said because... Keep a path far from her. Don't go near the door of her house, much less talk to her, much less go inside, much less do whatever you're going to do inside there. Lest you lose your honor in the, in the view of other people. How many of you grew up knowing that honor and your name was about all you really had? You don't want anybody to talk bad about your honor. Yeah. Um, that's something that you either got or you have it. And once you have it, you don't want to lose it. But Solomon here says, listen, you're going to lose your honor, not just in the, in the view of God, but in the view of others. Remember, people were coming from all over the known world to come to this man for wisdom. And he says, listen, if you go down this path, then you will not only lose honor with God, You'll lose honor with other people. And when you look in the mirror, they didn't have mirrors, by the way, back then. But if you were to look in the mirror, you might even lose honor, your own honor. Don't go down this path. You have a lot to use, lose. And your dignity, you might lose your dignity to the one who is cruel. It sounds like everything that makes you honorable, that makes you dignified, that makes you unique, that makes you admirable, all that stuff you're putting at risk if you do this. Kind of like a guy I 
heard on the radio. He lost everything because he did what was right in his own eyes. Okay, verses, uh, anybody else want to talk about? Seven through 11. I guess I'm sitting here wondering why <clears throat> King David didn't get to read Proverbs. <laughs> you know, I'm assuming it didn't come out in his error. Yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering, where, loud, right? <laughs> where's this wisdom? Did David not know this? Was he not a man after God's own heart? And is this not God's own heart? Is it true to anybody? that you go down this path, if you're an unfaithful person to the one you promised your love to, then that path is not going to be a fruitful one. I mean, that is not, uh, the book of Genesis talks about that. What are we missing here? What did David miss? I mean, he lived with God. He was blessed um, when he was very young. He was blessed when he fought uh, um, Goliath. He was blessed when he became king. Did he just forget? How can people who are so blessed forget the blessings of God? Can you imagine people like that? <laughs> <laughs> I know, we're all laughing. <laughs> yeah. I get caught up in this. I'm sorry, but you, you, it doesn't make good sense, does it? Yeah. This is not something new. It's something that David should have known. It's something that Solomon is trying to teach, and I guess because has a whole chapter. In fact, you're going to hear a lot of this in the next chapter too, and a few more times. What What is a big secret in the Bible? It talks more about sex than it does about money. Uh, I, I don't have time to talk about why that may be the case, but uh, apparently there is some, some connection with how we express those gifts that we have of sexuality and and stewardship and things like that in our, in our spirituality. But that's for another day. Uh, but yeah, it would have been nice if David could have seen this. You think he would have listened, Craig? Not to I, think, I think if, since he was a, a, a man with, of God's heart, I think he um, just chose to go a different route. Even though he had all the wisdom and blessings of God, I think he... Yeah as we sometimes do think we're up on a level where we are handling it and we don't need God, maybe. Oh, okay. Now, Dee, you were going to, you just kind of shook your head and said no, that he would not have changed. Is that correct? I don't think so. I think he okay. had all, I think what happened is he just, you know, he saw something he wanted and he went after it. You mean he and forgot he, everything? Yep. He just chose, like Craig said. Sometimes, sometimes that happens to us. We just let go of it. I'm glad you said that, D. I've, I've, <laughs> I've seen it. So, no. Oh, you've seen it. <laughs> yep. Listen, I can even come closer than that. I've lived it. Mm -hmm. I know how that is. And it's like self. It, you know, it's a lot of what's going on now. What's good for me right now? And you're not looking at the big picture and looking at what God has given you. Selfish. Does that? Say, it's yes. Selfish. It's self indulgence. It's selfish. It's uh. I mean, we don't deny that this Bible is, tells the truth. We just choose not to do the truth. It's true. Not so much we don't know this stuff. We just don't want to do this stuff in the Bible. Can you imagine a bunch of people on Sunday morning gathering together, reading this stuff, and going out and living like they want to? <laughs> a bunch of people like that? We call them church. <laughs> And that's why I still have a job. <laughs> we need each other so much. It's because we're like that. We are not dying because of lack of knowledge. We're dying because of lack of will. What yeah. is God going to have to do to set the stage for us to want to do the right thing? I mean, he lays out here. This is two paths. You can go down this path. And in fact, you said... Uh, uh, somebody read back in verse 5 it talked about the grave mm -hmm. uh, Doris I think you read that you said yeah. hell not the just feet go down to death down to death. steps take hold on hell okay yeah exactly so um, whatever that is that's pretty bad and then it 
to that life over here and wealth over here and dignity and honor over here. You got two paths. You can go down this one and this is what you get. You can go down another one and this is what you get. And at the end of your I think, life, look back. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I think it goes back to verse two where my translation says discretion. And I just looked that up for the uh -huh. definition. And what... <laughs> One of the definitions says the freedom to decide what should be done in a particular situation. Yep. Okay. The freedom to decide. So you have two choices. As Joshua said later on, in the, uh, well, earlier on, when he says, you have before you life and death. Blessing. Choose life. life. Choose mm -hmm. life, he says. Mm -hmm. And Solomon here says, choose life. And we choose death that's the only other things we do and that is discernment it looks so good but it's so bad uh rod do we not also from those choices either good or bad have what i call the ripple effect the ripple effect now tell me about that what does that mean well i think depending on which path you go look how many more consequences or positive things can happen Okay. On your choices. And again, it goes back to that selfishness thing. All right. So if you choose, if you make this one choice, it ripples out into, I don't know if you can see my hands, it ripples out into a lot of different things that this choice is easier, this choice is clearer. Um, so once you make that one choice, uh, I've quoted this many times to the classes I taught. Uh, it comes from Shakespeare, the valiant, the valiant, die, uh, the coward dies a thousand deaths. Mm -hmm. Only once it's just that one decision uh, that makes it clear. And that's the ripple effect. When you said ripple effect, and when you talked about selfishness, I suddenly thought about how do our decisions affect other people, whether they're good decisions or bad decisions. You know, we're thinking about ourselves. Um, it doesn't say pornography in here because pornography is actually a Greek word. It means false intimacy. Um, but uh, when I look at, when I deal with people who are, are struggling with pornography, um, that's such a real kind of thing. And it's called a victimless, a victimless sin. There is no such thing as a sin. You remember in the New Testament where Jesus uh, is sitting there talking to some people, some scribes and Pharisees, and they haul out this woman who's caught in the very act of adultery. Mm -hmm. Now, you remember what they were going to do with this woman? Stone. Stone. Yeah. They were going to kill. This is a capital offense we're talking about here. How many of you think, no, this just affects two people, maybe. This won't hurt anybody else. It hurts everybody. It hurts everybody else. It hurts whole communities. That's why, uh, with the people of Israel, it hurt everybody. If you have ever been in a victim of adultery, you know how bad it hurts. If you have ever been an adul adulterer, you know how that much hurt. How that one decision affects many other decisions that you make. Uh, that's why I'm so glad Grace is here. Because... We have all gone this down this path. Uh, I think that's what, when I read those sons and daughters are children of God. So anyway, uh, we don't have time. We're running out of time. Uh, verses 15 through 18. Has somebody read that one yet? Drink water from your own cistern and fresh water from your own well. Should you springs be, should your springs be, be the first abroad streams of water in the streets. Let them be yours alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. How far did you say? 15 uh, to 18? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that That's was 18. Great. Thank you. Thank okay. you. It says here, you know, he says, first of all, look at where you're drinking from. Jeremiah later on talks about drinking from broken cisterns. You know how much water is in this land? Not much. That's because it's so brown. Um, they have to collect rainwater off the roof, water to drink. So water is very precious. And these cisterns are dug out. Um, that's why you see in the Old Testament, Jacob's well, or a lot of other wells, 
that become holy places because it's one of those places where water is uh, flowing and living water sometimes. Notice 13 and you, uh, uh, 15, and you read it just great, D. Drink from your own cistern, running water from your own well. You know what running water is? Spring. Springs and stuff like that. And anybody who's been a scout or been uh, lost and had to drink water, or if you watch Survivor or Naked Prey or any of those shows that you might watch, you always look for running water, they always teach us. So that's where the living water is. That's where the running water is. And it's almost like this is stale water over here. It's, it's water trapped up. Um, and it talks about uh, drink from your own streams um, and things like that. Let me very quickly also read, we're going to skip a couple of verses, and I want to read 21 through 23, if I may. And this is why you do this, by the way. For your ways are in full view of the Lord. And he examines all your paths. How many of you believe, just by a show of hands, believe that God is always with us? I, I see those hands. God is always with us. And he's watching everything. Every move we make. Uh, it's kind of like the old police song. Uh, be watching you. <laughs> you make every you know, uh, vow you break. I'll be watching you. God is is watching everything, and he examines our past. The evil deeds of the wicked ensnare them. It traps them. This road that he's talking about, it leads to a trap. It's not just a bad road. It's going to lead to, we're going to be trapped. It's like those people who choose an addiction, or rather an addiction chooses them. I have friends, and uh, I, I, I go through addictions myself. I'm in recovery also is that uh, you never go out of that addiction. You always know there's a trap. If you just turn a least little bit, uh, that addiction may come on you. That's why we talk about always being in recovery. Uh, I know that with a certain substance, I can't come near that substance. I can't go near that relationship. I can't go near that idol uh, because it is too close to me. It's a trap for me. may not be for you, but it is for me but the wicked ensnares you. What I used to use for comfort has now become my cage. That's what that is. What I used to use for uh, pleasure has now become my pain. Uh, the cords of their sins hold them fast. Notice they're trapped and then they've got these cords around them. Are they ever gonna be out of these cords? No, we can't untie ourselves. It's like pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. Would somebody like to try that now? And <laughs> have you ever tried to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps? It does not work. Uh, I have some uh, family who's in Texas. Those big old uh, things in Texas, uh, boots in Texas. <laughs> they fell over trying to uh, pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. It says, verse 23, for the lack of discipline, they, they be sad. They will really hurt. They will make a mistake. Is what the Bible say? For the lack of discipline, they will This is serious business. If you lack discipline in this area, you will die led astray by their own great folly. Now again, I thought we were going to hear about something real spiritual here, something that was going to keep me out of heaven, something was going to affect my spirituality, and what they're doing is they're talking about strange men and women, they're talking about adultery, and you know good Christian folks don't mess with adultery. Well, some do. <laughs> what Jesus said what adultery really is whoever looks lust on another person whoever wants to possess something that's not his a person an attribute <coughs> um, lust is one of the seven deadly sins do you know about those anybody raised mm -hmm. in the Catholic Church know about the seven deadly sins they're the ones that are really big uh, that you don't want to do because they cause great damage Lust is one of the uh, great sins. Now, it's interesting, in the German, 
lust is means something else. It does still mean it's something that is not yours, but it's an intensity that you're always looking for. It's an experience, it's an adventure, it's a novelty. It's, uh, it's a thrill that you're always looking for. Uh, that's loosed in German. It's, it's got that same uh, meaning as uh, something that I crave, something that I desire, that I'm willing to throw away anything else for. That's what this passage means to me. Is you know, I'm not out of the woods just because I'm not chasing another woman right now. Because what am I chasing? What is the strange thing in my life that I may be uh, willing to give away for? Is it a relationship? <laughs> is it a substance? Is it a habit? What am I trading my life away for? That seems to be. What do you get out of this passage? What is your takeaway for this passage? I'm okay. There's a sweet little girl right there. I'm glad. <laughs> hey. Uh, now, I'm glad she came in. She came in just in time. Do we want to read this chapter to that little girl? <laughs> no. It's in the Bible. <laughs> no, let's not do that. This may be more meat than milk for some people, but there's something for all of us here. If is there something for us here? What else did you get out of this passage? Pretty big ripples, I'd say, Rod. It is tremendously big ripples. I, I mean, it, what, you know, this is a, a tremendously important choice that we make. Whatever, however we interpret it, it seems to be a matter of life and death to us. It reminds us, by the way, that sin is not something we do. Seeing a little boy over there. I, I don't let him hear this. Sin is not something we do. <laughs> hey, Colin. That's fine. Because <laughs> he's not too young to know this. And I wish somebody had told me this. Sin is not something we do. We grew up believing that uh, going to movies on Sunday, dancing and drinking, spitting, going with girls who do, all those things are sin. And if we avoided that, then we'd be good people. We'd be good Christian folks. That is not what this Bible says. What the Bible says is these are the symptom of your sin. Sin is not what we do. It's a condition that we have, that we all have. And that it motivates us to make every decision that we make. It's the selfishness that you talked about. It's that egocentricism that you talked about. It's that uh, desire for strangeness and uh, things like that that we talk about. Um, that's something that we need to tell one another and we need to be responsible for is that this, uh, this is bigger than sins. It is the very heart of what we do and what we are. Well, I've taken your time up and I hope I've given you something to think about. Also, I hope I've given you something in this lesson. I hope God's word has given you something to do something about. And so next week you can come back and say, here's a praise. I changed this in my life. Or I did this differently. Because it was written for. All right. As for now, let me say my benediction to you. And thank you again for being here. And thank those of you who are watching this uh, after Friday lunch. If you want to join us live, just send me a, your email and I will uh, put you on this uh, Zoom meeting and we'll have 100 people here before too long. I can't wait for the discussion about that. Uh, those of you who are on it, who contributed tonight, thank you for your bravery and thank you for your, uh, your uh, sensitivity and your honesty. I appreciate that. Now will the Lord bless you and keep you. Will the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, Rod. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Happy Fourth, everybody. All Happy right, y'all be good. Bye.